ICCM presents Professor Stephen Clift. So today, my presentation will be in two parts. Um, in part one, I want to talk about the development of the field over the last 20 years and focus on the recent publication from the World Health Organization of a major report on arts and health research. I want to raise some critical concerns about this report and argue that research in the field needs robust critique. Then in part two, I want to explore what this report has to contribute to community music practitioners and researchers. I'll conclude with some questions for discussion. I will not say anything today about COVID-19 and the effects the pandemic has had on all aspects of our lives including engagement in the arts and music. This will be the focus of a further webinar on the 24th of September. Many of you may not be familiar with the field of arts and health and its development over the last 20 years. And so I want to take the title of this wonderful painting by Gauguin as a starting point. Where have we come from? Who are we? Where are we going? The recent origins in the UK of serious attention to the social function of the arts and their contribution to health can be traced back to the late 1990s. And these two documents are of key importance. Uh, the PAT-10 report of 2099 provides detailed case studies of community arts and sports projects responding to local needs and circumstances. It emphasizes equality of access to arts and sports participation for what they can offer in addressing social inequalities and exclusion. And it argues that participation in the arts and sport can promote self-confidence, a sense of achievement, and improve mental well-being. The Arts for Health publication from 2000 reports a survey of 90 arts projects across the UK and gives 15 detailed case studies. It stresses the quality of the artistic work produced with inspired leadership from creative artists and suggests the arts contribute to health through improved personal skills, new friendships, and opportunities to celebrate what is created. Moving ahead, to the last few years, two reports serve to give an account of the field currently, both nationally and internationally. The Creative Health Report presents a typology of eight different forms of engagement in the arts for health, with four being central. Arts in healthcare environments, arts therapies, arts on prescription and participatory arts. It provides case studies of arts activities for health and presents evidence of impacts across the life course. But it has been criticized by Kate Phillips for a lack of critical perspective on the evidence. The WHO scoping review provides a useful typology of the many ways in which the arts may contribute to health, both in prevention and in treatment and across the life course. It reviews over 9,000 studies in a carefully structured way arriving at clear conclusions and recommendations. But I've written a critique of the report, highlighting a lack of critical perspective on the research reviewed. I'm also grateful to Stephen Pritchard for giving me space on his blog, Colouring in Culture, to express further reflections on research in the field. But I also want to mention this recent publication by Matarazzo for the account it gives of the history of community and participative arts. He defines participatory arts as a practice that connects professional and non-professional artists in an act of co-creation. This book, I think, is essential reading for anyone interested in community arts and health. And the stress he places on the role of the artist is shown by the fact that the word arts appears 290 times, but artist appears 571 times. In the WHO report, by contrast, arts appears 616 times, but artist appears only 11 times. In a forthcoming review of this report, I ask, 
Should not the role of the creative artist and the process of co-creation constitute the sine qua non of arts and health practice? I want to move on to talk about the need for a robust critique. I call this presentation the need for robust critique of arts and health research. And I want to make some further comments about the WHO report and outline three different approaches in undertaking critique. The Van Court and Finn Review is an impressive achievement, and it's good to see the World Health Organization take a serious interest in this field. The report has clearly attracted a great deal of attention, and it was the most downloaded health evidence network report in 2019. The review details the different ways in which the arts may support the promotion of health, the treatment and care of people with acute health needs, and the long-term management of chronic health conditions. It also performs a valuable service in directing the attention of policymakers, commissioners, and managers of services in health towards the many contributions that the arts could make to health. But positive progress in the field should not blind us to real limitations in some of the research that finds its way into peer-reviewed journals. The claims made by researchers should always be approached with a robust critical attitude. I want to suggest three approaches towards undertaking critique, and these are reflected in my review of the WHO report and various recent blog posts. Firstly, we can use common sense to assess the plausibility of claims. Take, for example, the claim that the arts are crucial to reducing poor health and inequality, given in a press release from University College London on the release of the WHO report. We all know from the work of Michael Marmot that there are social gradients in health and that access to decent food, housing, education and employment are all crucially important for good health. But can we really regard the arts as being crucial? And can the arts really reduce inequality? Another example is the claim made by Jean Cohen back in 2006, that participation in group singing reduces risks of falling in older people. This finding has been widely cited without any critical commentary, but the link between singing and falls is implausible and has never been replicated. Secondly, a great deal of arts and health research can be broadly described as positivist. Such studies employ experimental designs, they specify independent and dependent variables, they use forms of quantitative measurement of outcomes and inferential statistics to draw conclusions supported by significant p-values. Such research can be criticized if it fails to live up to generally accepted standards for research of this kind. These have become increasingly formalized through the pre-registration of research, standards for reporting outcomes fully, and checklists for assessing quality. As research in arts and health has grown, an increasing number of systematic reviews have appeared, and it's striking how often the research papers considered for such reviews are excluded from the review because of their limitations. And thirdly, we can judge research from a different philosophical perspective and question the assumptions on which it rests. This approach is found, for example, in the view that a central problem with experimental research is the failure to recognize the fundamentally moral, rule-based nature of social life, the role of individual agency, and the centrality of language in our social constructions of reality. It is very relevant in the context of arts and health practice and research, where inappropriate expressions, such as a music intervention or a music treatment, are often used. Uh, in a moment, I want to go on to uh, the second part of my talk, and I just want to indicate what we're going to do. Um, I'd, look, I'd like to look a little bit further at the WHO report and what it tells us about music, health and well-being. I want to consider the relevance of the WHO report for community music and community musicians. 
I'll highlight two systematic reviews and an example of an RCT on singing and health. And then finally, I'll raise some questions for further discussion. So if anybody has a question that they would like to ask Stephen, please do um, ask that now. I'm just wondering whether uh, people have read my review of the WHO report or any of my blogs. Some of you may well have done that. Others of you may not. Uh, and so at this point, uh, I'd hope that um, what I've said so far would encourage you to do that. Hilary, hello. Sorry, Stephen, do you want to carry it's on? Did you what did you have a question, Hilary? Yeah, we'll have a comment as well as a question. Okay. Um, just to say hello and um, thank you. Um, I agree obviously with what you're saying. I think there's too little critique of um of music and health, arts and health uh, practice generally, and too few people willing to have a conversation about when it doesn't work and when it causes harm and the kind of bad practice that is out there. I think it, it I think if anything, we are in danger of being kind of um, too busy evangelizing about the benefit of arts and health as a sector. So I'm really welcoming what you're doing. And I just wondered if you would maybe comment on whether there is much literature on, on kind of any research on when it doesn't help that you're aware of, because I'm aware of very little. Well, I, I don't think there is. I think that what you find in academic publishing is a very strong bias on the part of journals to publish positive results. There's also reluctance on the part of researchers to publish uh, findings from studies where things don't work out as they would have hoped. I mean, I've had this experience myself where uh, the results from uh, studies that don't appear particularly positive and you feel reluctant to publish. Uh, so I think that it's very true that there isn't um, a, a great deal of material in the published literature, which is identifying where things don't work or where, as you say, interventions might actually cause some harm. So, um, Joe, I'm, I'm wondering whether we should continue and, uh, and then make sure we've got plenty of time at the end for some further discussion or exchange. Yes, Stephen, let's continue with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, before I go on, I'd, I'd, I'd just like to say I'm very grateful for the degree of interest that's been shown in my talk today. And I'd, I'd be very happy to engage with, with any of you that has joined this uh, webinar in, in further discussions or email correspondence about the issues that I'm raising. But I, I want now to um, consider what the WHO report tells us about music health and well-being, and ask what relevance it has for practitioners and researchers in community music. I'll comment on some key sources on music and health referenced in the report and raise a few questions for discussion. It's interesting that the art form discussed most often in the WHO review is music. The word music occurs over 600 times in the report overall. And this slide shows that other report art forms are discussed less often. Only dance comes close. And of course, dance generally involves music. The term music is qualified in several ways. Music therapy is mentioned very commonly. This is not surprising given the health orientation of the report, but music therapy is a specialized activity and may have little connection with community music. Music listening is also mentioned fairly often and indicates that the WHO report is including research in which the effects of recorded music are explored. Again, this may have little relevance to community music. It's also disappointing to see that the phrase music making is so infrequent and community music music participation and music engagement does not appear at all. However, the picture looks a little more positive for active engagement in music when we look for references to 
um, appears in the text 35 times, and song, or songs, or uh, is a, an indication that the search was for song or songs. Song appears a further 14 times. More specific expressions show a concern for active engagement in group singing. Over 50 sources are cited. This is much lower, actually, than the total number of singing and health studies that have been published over the last 20 years. But as we can see, five of these sources are systematic reviews which capture many more studies. Seven of the sources are randomized control trials, and other sources report qualitative investigations. The principal health concerns addressed in the research reviewed are mental health and well-being, Parkinson's, respiratory conditions, dementia, and cancer. And it's interesting to consider the specific ways in which singing as an activity might be relevant and have health benefits. For example, in improving breathing in people with COPD or improving speech, which is impaired by Parkinson's disease. Here are two examples of recent systematic reviews. I'm actually one of the authors in both of these reviews. In the WHO report, these are used to support a range of positive claims about the contribution that regular singing can make to the health and well-being of people affected by mental health challenges and respiratory illnesses. However, the authors of these reviews are very much more circumspect in their conclusions. In the Lewis review, for example, only six studies were included. And while they say that singing has the potential to improve health-related quality of life, particularly related to physical health without causing significant side effects, they add the following caveat. There is, they say, a significant risk of bias in many of the existing studies with small numbers of subjects overall, and little comparison can be made between studies owing to their heterogeneity in design and that larger and longer term trials are needed. And here is an example of a groundbreaking randomized control trial by Fancourt and her colleagues. This explores the value of community singing for mothers with postnatal depression. The title is interesting, Effects of Singing Interventions on Symptoms of Postnatal Depression, and reflects the positivistic framework within which the study was conceived and carried out. The study is interesting in showing that overall there were no differences after 10 weeks between the mothers in the three arms of the trial. They all showed clear reductions in reported feelings of depression. However, those mothers who at the outset reported moderate to severe symptoms of depression showed faster improvement in the singing group. So far, this study has not been repeated and this finding has not been replicated, but considerable claims are made for the outcomes of this one small study. A video has been produced of the findings and you may like to read the paper and watch the video and decide for yourself whether you are persuaded by the results. I'd be very interested to hear what you think. This study is described as an intervention. This language is understandable in a study set within a health context, but is the language appropriate? Personally, I think not. Consider for example, the work of Catherine Birch in ICCM here in York in facilitating singing groups with women in local prisons. If a woman commits a crime, is arrested, tried, sentenced and imprisoned, the criminal justice system intervenes to take away her liberty. But Catherine, in creating a space for music within a prison, is not intervening in the lives of women. Rather, she is offering an invitation to engage, an invitation that respects their personal agency and offers freedom of choice to create something beautiful together. My views on matters of freedom and creativity are very much influenced by the life and thought of Nietzsche. 
And you may like to read about his ideas on living life as an artist in this link here. More fundamentally, we might ask whether it was really the singing that generated the benefits that Van Court and colleagues report. This actually is a question that has plagued me and the Dahan Center team from the very start of our research program on singing and health. It's just such an obvious question to ask if you're arguing for singing being beneficial for health, but is it really the singing? And perhaps the truth is that there is nothing unique about singing. As Londale and Day have recently shown, the well-being benefits attributed by choral singers were no different from those expressed by participants in five other musical and sporting activities. As they say, choral singing may not be uniquely beneficial. Any leisure activity that offers opportunities for improvement, mastery of a new skill, or a sense of accomplishment might have a positive effect on our psychological well-being. And this actually is essentially the same conclusion that can be drawn from this impressively large scale online survey reported by Fancourt and colleagues. Just under 48,000 people reported on their emotion regulation strategies when they were engaged in one favorite artistic creative activity from a list of 16 they could choose from. The result was that all activities engaged the three strategies of avoidance, approach, and self-development equally, irrespective of whether participants were reporting on singing, or instrumental music, or dancing, or gardening, or cookery, or textile crafts such as embroidery. In a detailed critique of this paper, I conclude if people voluntarily engage in activities they value and enjoy, they will say, if asked, that they benefit from them. So to conclude, I've worked in the field of arts and health for over 20 years, and I find it somewhat painful raising these critical questions. I've come in for some criticism for others in the field for being too harsh or combative and non-collegiate, but I do feel my criticisms require a considered response. So here are some starting points for discussion. Do the arts and music have a distinctive and substantial contribution to make to health and well-being? If arts and music is used in a planned way to promote health and well-being, is this ever an intervention into the lives of others. And what about community musicians? What role do they have in helping to influence the direction in which arts and health research is heading? And can community musicians help to reinforce the place of active participation, co-production, musical quality, and collaborative research as central values in the field of arts and health? Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. Um, really fabulous. I think we're going to hold on that slide there. So, Stephen, if you can leave that slide in view, that would be wonderful. We have a couple of comments in the chat. Simon, I wonder if I just read your comment here now. Um, you mentioned, I've often found that organisations focus on their method of delivery, so singing, knitting, walking for well-being, and so forth at the expense of taking a wider perspective of looking at what evidence approaches to how to increase well-being. And you're asking, uh, would this wider perspective not be a better starting point rather than focus on music or specific arts? So Simon, I wonder if you could speak a little about that and then Stephen can respond. Is that yeah. yeah, that's fine. Hi Joe. how are you doing? Uh, good to see you. Hi everybody. Yeah, so we as an organisation talk about delivering an intervention because of the sort of commissioning landscape that we exist in. So it's a useful shortcut to talk to local authorities or CCGs. 
But what we're actually trying to create is uh, not focus on, on what we're delivering, which happens to be music tech mentoring, but focus on much more on how we deliver it. Uh, so taking self-determination theory, which is arguably the world's most evidenced uh, framework for understanding how we in- impact on motivation and well-being, SDT highlights the need to create spaces where people feel autonomous, where they feel they have uh, a sense of competence and where they feel connected to other people people so the way i feel about it is that you know those three identified psychological needs are are what have been evidenced as being uh, vital to impacting on well-being and when we improve well-being we get better health education social engagement outcomes and what i see from organizations again and again is them focusing on what they deliver Whereas actually a wider perspective where we focus on, you know, if we looked at all those organizations, I can guarantee where things are going well, that they will be creating those feelings amongst their participants. So a wider understanding of that is a much more sensible approach and educative process that we should be talking to people about who are setting up programs. These are the things you should be focusing on to get these desired outcomes. We should be, yeah, not doing things at people, creating the spaces where we allow them to flourish through these things that we know have these positive impacts. Well, I don't disagree with you at all. I think that you've summed up very well uh, the, the view that I take. And, and of course, the, the point you make about a, a term like intervention being a shorthand which speaks to people from a health perspective is exactly right. Uh, and and, and I'm, uh, I'm perfectly clear that that's what's happening when... Uh, you, people design studies and report on them. They're using a particular kind of language. But I, I do think that um, we've got to recognise the importance of the processes that you've described very well, Simon. And, and I think there can be space within the way in which we talk about uh, projects and we report on them, which uh, respects those those processes, uh, it, it you know the the title. I mean, I somebody has said uh, in the comments that you know surely um, a study that was reported in two thousand and eight there isn't time for it to be replicated. Um, of course, that's true. Uh, I'm really making the point that in this field there is not sufficient attention given to the need to replicate and to repeat and to show in a variety of different settings with different people that you were talking about robust effects. Uh, The Cohen study was published in 2006. Nobody has ever bothered, bothered, I don't know, nobody has ever taken the trouble to repeat what Gene Cohen did and to use the same kinds of outcome measures. Uh, and, and so I'm just giving that as an example where claims can be made, which just on, on common sense grounds really don't make sense. The idea that people coming together to sing is going to make any difference to their, to their physical stability and, and reduce the risk of falling is just implausible in my view. Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, I, I think, it, thank I, think you, it's, Simon. I think it's in, incumbent on organisations, though, to get better at collecting wider uh, aspects of evidence. Uh, you know, yes. we have to take a much more mixed evidence approach. There has to be yes. this ability to capture the soft outcomes, which is so important to. Uh, so many arts organisations, often at the expense of the quant evidence that is so vital for commissioning organisations. Yes. But you need to collect all of it. Um, yes. And yes. collect it well. And, uh, yes, it, it, that's absolutely right. And um, I focused uh, a little bit on uh, on Daisy Fancourt's work because she's the principal author of the WHO report. And actually, uh, she's a, a, an excellent model of a researcher that is adopting a very broad methodological approach. And some very fine publications have come 
from uh, Daisy Fancourt and her colleagues uh, that are qualitative in nature and they're drawing on uh, narrative accounts from people involved in a variety of different projects to explore how these things are working and what people's experience is. So it, it, that's very true. So it, it, the, the picture is um, is positive in some respects and, and and less so in others, I think. Absolutely. Thank you. Stephen, did you want to respond to any of the other comments flagging up? We'll choose some. Uh, One response to your current conversation in the chat there from Grenville, talking about research funds being small and difficult to access, and that perhaps replicating existing studies is neither attractive for the researcher or the funder. So that's just <laughs> a connection to the conversation you and Simon were just having. Um, yes. But if you want to pick up on anything else that's... Well, well let, me just, let me just respond to that. So um, okay. thank you, Grenville. It's, it's, it's lovely that you've been able to join us this afternoon. Um, of course, everybody in the arts field knows that in relation to funding, funders want something new and novel and different and so many examples over many years uh, that we we'll all know of where projects have been funded for a short space of time they seem to work very well but can they be sustained and will funders put money into sustaining them no they want to go on to the next thing and i think it's true also perhaps in relation to research that the idea of just repeating what somebody else has done doesn't seem particularly attractive or original but i think actually from a scientific point of view replication is is really essential it's essential to the whole scientific process to be able to show that findings that emerge from a study can be reproduced by independent groups elsewhere uh, and it's on that basis that we move forward. Stephen, I'm noticing that um, there's been one or two comments in the mentee chat around your discussion about the use of the term intervention. Um, and I know Michael Bonshaw had posted and asked what appropriate language might be useful instead. Um, and I just wondered if you wanted to comment a little bit more about that and just expand on that a little bit for us. Well, I don't know whether people find my reference to your work, Catherine, um, useful in that respect. I think partly it's, it's a matter of the common use of language. I mean, who am I? through music or any other art form, who am I to intervene in the lives of other people? Uh, it just seems to me to be the wrong term to use. Uh, it, it doesn't reflect the reality of a situation in which people are coming together. Of course, you've got people in a position of, of leadership, perhaps even of authority, because they, they have the skill to allow something to happen, but they're not doing things to people. They're inviting engagement and everybody in a space where music is being made together is an active participation in the process of music making. I mean, I admire very much the position that Matarazzo takes in relation to community arts. He insists on talking about the role of professional artists working with non-professional artists, that everybody engaged in a creative project in a community setting is there contributing to the artistic process as an artist, whether professional or not. So I think it's a matter, I think it's just a matter of language. I also think that we can so easily slip into um, thinking that somehow the intervention directly impacts on health outcomes uh, without considering the, the active agency 
of the individual that's engaged in the activity. Uh, of course, we all understand that that's not the reality of it. But if that's not the reality of it, why do we use that language and talk about an, an intervention impacting on a health outcome, such as symptoms of depression? There's a statement here about the generic ways in which activities are discussed in some reports can be too vague. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, much more attention needs to be given to describing what is actually going on in, um, in musical activities which are designed to make a difference to people's health and well-being of, of, of how they're actually working. I think this is uh, often something which is, is, is not detailed sufficiently. I just wonder, Stephen, if you can see the chat, there's some interesting discussion taking place about the term intervention. Um, yes. And that's coming through as an interesting thread. So I just wonder if you would elaborate a little bit more about that term and your thoughts. Well, I think I think the other thing is uh, I'd like to go back to the point that I raised in relation to the Matarazzo report about the use of the term art and arts, and on the one hand, and reference to artists on the other. I, I, I mean, F, F, surely everybody knows that the, the personality, the qualities, the skills of a musician working in community settings is a fundamental factor in determining how things work and the extent to which people in care. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've sung in many choirs over the years, and I, I know from personal experience what a difference the, the, the personality and the skills of a choral director makes to the quality of the experience. I've, I've been part of choirs that I've left because I, I felt that the, uh, the, the, the choral leader was um, uh, it, it just, just not sufficiently engaging or skillful or friendly or, you know, all of these things that make such a difference to people's experience of an activity. So it's how often do we find in reports of arts and health research discussions of the characteristics of the people who are delivering the activities? Stephen, I'm also wondering, you posed four questions at the end of your presentation, and I'm wondering whether it would be useful for the group for us to return to those and reflect on those, unless there is anything in the Mentimeter post that's um, that you'd like to respond to now. Um, I'm just wondering, we have a good amount of time to continue our conversation. We have about 15 minutes more, so it might be worth uh, returning to those if that is of interest to you. Yes, I, it, I think what's, I mean, I must confess that I'm not um, very familiar with the literature on community music or research on community music, but I think it's striking to me um, that the WHO report doesn't refer once to the phrase community music. So uh, what that points to is that somehow all the literature that's out there on community music has simply not been um, accessed as a basis for um, putting that review together. So in that sense, it would seem that the report has little to offer community musicians and people involved in community music research, even though it's very clear that many community musicians will be working with people in ways which impact on their well-being and health. And they may well have written about this and conducted research on it. Thank 
you, Stephen. I can see in the chat that Liz Mella um, has said that she's curious about how language and research with the notion of mutuality in the healing relationship unfolds to co-create something new and how this might be recognized as a contribution to knowledge in research times. Um, I was wondering, Liz, if you wanted to um, comment or speak about that a little for Stephen to respond to. Is Liz available? Is she? Oh, here I am. Hello, Liz. All right. Hello, everybody. Good to see so many people here. Uh, well, I, I noticed um, John Blen was also in 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 the uh, uh, seminar and and June as well, and just just trying to sort of maybe find a way of reaching out into uh, different fields that re that research this notion of mutuality. I'm liking the idea that we're shifting. Uh, uh, understanding uh, the field perspective have how you need to use words like intervention f for you know funding bids but when we shift the power relationship and question what that means to create a more mutual sh shared space and when we try and attend to what happens in that mutual shared space between pairs triads uh, groups you know what 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 is actually emerging here how do we research it and how might we acknowledge um, in research terms what is actually being co-produced i think it's a big question um and and i'm very curious about it <laughs> so i'll just put that out um uh the the subtle nuances of that those unfolding moments One thing that occurs to me, Liz, is that um, I think if there were more emphasis on the nature of the music making and people's engagement with music and what it is people are gaining from that and what they're learning through it and what they're able to express through the medium of music, which is helpful to them in terms of their well-being, um, I've been, uh, I, I believe that my friend Vivian Ellis has joined this uh, webinar and I've been very impressed by work that Vivian has done at Dragon Cafe in London with um, a, a wide range of people who in one way or another have experienced significant challenges to their mental health. And Vivian has had a lot of experience working with people actually over many years, week after week, over many years, and working uh, more recently through songwriting and exploring the way in which uh, the writing of songs and the performing of songs gives people a voice, an opportunity to express their experience and their, and their, and their difficulties and finds ways of arriving at some kind of resolution or some source of comfort or comradeship through the joint enterprise of creating together and then having the opportunity, if they wish, to perform. You know, so it's the whole, I mean, I think if we could move to a position where we can document in, in, in a way that uh, allows everybody's voice to be heard, uh, we're going to arrive at a much deeper understanding of what, of what resource music offers to people. What, what um, uh, Tia Denora many years ago talked about music providing affordances. It offers people something. It allows them to uh, engage with other people in a different kind of way, to explore their thoughts and feelings, but actually to, to, uh, to, to express them and make them public and to share them. So I think uh, at every step of the way, this kind of process ought to be documented and everybody engaged in it has, uh, should have an equal voice in in documenting this process. 
that's slightly rambling, Liz. I'm sorry about that, but I, I don't know whether I don't know whether Vivian, are you are you here? Might you like to say something about your experience? Thank you for um, for mentioning that work. And um, yes, it the, the, it's a challenging thing to document it and evaluate it, and also to um, also to or how to say it's um a, 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 the dragon cafe is that is a user led organization and i find that there's a lot of most of the time we're working in antithesis to what's around us which is not user led and that's very important that user led perspective um and in trying to document it and evaluate it i've seen that there's there's not an absence of user-led research, but it's often not emphasised or given the space that it could have. And that and there's maybe something very fruitful in there, which I'll try to explore in the next um, webinar. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vivian. Vivian's going to be speaking more about her experience at Dragon Cafe under conditions of lockdown as a result of COVID-19. Could, could I just add a quick, could I just add something in response to Liz earlier? Hi, Liz. Uh, it's John, John here. I'm, I work, as you know, as a therapist, um, a psychotherapist rather than a music therapist, but I also work as using music in many uh, in settings in training. And what I find is there is a concept in therapy called judicious self-disclosure, which is different from gossip. But it's when we as trainers, presenters, whatever, can share what's going on inside us uh, in, in a way that supports the work. It's a judgment. But if we can do that, I think sometimes that it enables us to build some more of that mutuality so that people can feel safe to share something that's very personal and about which they may feel very vulnerable. And so I would add to what Stephen was saying about earlier about um, the importance of looking at the performance. But I would think when we can also have um, a short moment as a group of reflecting on what that music making brought up for us in a free flowing, safe way, I think that really needs to be added because it's, it's often gold and part of the mix that gets missed out under our pressures to do the right thing uh, in in research or applying for uh, <clears throat> to get funding or whatever. So that's just my immediate response. Thank you for that, John. We've also got some really interesting comments in the chat from June Boyce Tillman, who would like to speak about those now. Um, June, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, elaborate on your comments in the chat? Yes, I think that the problem with the word intervention is that it doesn't belong in the arts and we've already heard this with the two previous speakers which is that um, in general the arts are produced co-intentionally and mutually they're not done to people and everybody would want a hand in doing them so it fits uneasily in a health service which also misguidedly has not seen health as co-intentional it has seen one group of people doing something to the other. There is um, a literature coming out of education in relation to the last comment that we had, which is that it is important for everyone, including the leader, to a certain extent to be vulnerable, which again is anti the health service practices, uh, that in a sense we share um, a lot of ourselves both as musicians, but even personally, to go back to the law. And that that's what creates co-intentionality. This is why we've got very little from drama, uh, because most the people doing community drama would be involved in co-intentionality, and they wouldn't want to see drama or community drama as intervention in some way. Uh, so I think that the paradigm of the health service that we have and actually in the, in the alternative health service, in the more holistic healing, we'll find much more of co-intentionality. 
Uh, but And the other thing that I've put in the chat room, which I know Stephen and I have discussed many times, and goes back to what is reported, not what is done, but what space does it take people into? And many of you will know that I've written a lot about liminality. Um, some people might call it spiritual, I do sometimes. But that it's how we get to that, that liminal space in which we are all one and united and so on. And that can be through music, but it can also be through sport or knitting together and so on. And the characteristic of that space, which is in fact um, a space, uh, uh, and we don't look at that particular space um, in, the, in the health literature, the health and, and the arts literature. If, if we looked at the characteristic of a space that we get people in, that people manage to get into, which contributes to their well-being. There's very little literature about that at all in the report, but there is in education, there is in music and spirituality. So that's my contribution to it. Thank you very much, June. It's lovely to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to respond, Stephen? Do you I want to respond to that? I, I, I don't know that I do immediately. I'll have to reflect on what you're saying, but I, I think the, 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 the term co-intentionality, I, I, I love that. I think that's a very, a very valuable contribution. Thank you. Stephen, I just wondered if you don't mind me responding to June from the perspective of the prison partnership. Sure, yes, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, just from the perspective of the prison partnership programme here at York St John University that I'm engaged with, and I really loved your um, bringing up the idea of space, June. It's so important, and obviously in the context of a, a prison, um, it's a very specific space that we're working in. The original project was set up as a theatre project. Um, so it's been running since 2013 um, with a drama therapist who's based here and theatre practitioners. And I came on board two years ago to set up a singing and songwriting programme. Um, when you were mentioning space, I was picturing where we work in the prison, which is a creative space that was set up about three or four years ago under the um, the new governor at Newhall and near Wakefield. And it's really fascinating how that has contributed so positively to that project in the sense that the women who come and work in that space with us um, in the rest of their week and in the way that, that the prison is set up, the spaces that they are inhabiting at every other point in the week um, speak about um, negativity and speak about isolation and um, restriction and all those things. And there's something about this, this space because it is set up as a, as a creative space and there's, um, it's much more comfortable than other areas of the prison and there is creative engagement going on there during the week. And all of those things are impactful. There's images, um, around the walls, there's murals, there's paintings, um, there's different things going on creatively. And, and I'm really interested, certainly in my PhD research, that's something that I'm wanting to engage with more and talk about more because you're absolutely right, it is so vital. And I think the fact that there are, there are different artistic and creative collaborations going on in that space, including theatre, but including also creative writing and poetry, um, and then the songwriting project that I'm running. Um, you've, you've given me a lot of food for thought. You've given, given me a lot to think about. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, you're very welcome. Can I, can I come in on, on what Catherine's just said? Um, because one of the problems with drama, and I was very involved for about 10 years, and I would, Catherine, I hope that you've looked at the big prison project that we, was in Winchester for 10 years, the drama project. The thing that defeated that project in the end, which was a co-project module in the drama programme and the prison, the thing that defeated it was that they no longer allowed them to use that space anymore. And, and that, that was the dilemma. So the availability of a suitable space, certainly in prison, 
And one of the big problems with prison is that the, the uh, people have no space. So to even have a space, um, and we've worked a lot in the chapel, the chapels often provide a, a lovely space too, to get out of the cell and get into a, a bigger space in itself is therapeutic, almost regardless of what you do in it. <laughs> so I think the point you make, but do look at the book by Annie McCain on the long project in Winchester, um, in Winchester prison. Thank you for all of the questions and discussions and comments so far. Before we come to a close, Stephen, I wonder if there's anything else that you wanted to add or if there's just perhaps one more question. Joe, I think uh, the only thing that I'd like to say is that um, I do hope that this presentation is the starting point for uh, further conversations about the issues that I'm raising. The specific criticisms that I've made of some of the uh, reports and studies that I've commented on um, may not be fair or they may not be accurate or I, I'm very open to being challenged on what I've said. I think what's needed is is more of a dialogue about these things and I'm very willing to take part in further discussions. That's wonderful. Thank you, Stephen. And I think you mentioned that you were happy to share the slide. So if that's the case, we can distribute through the ICCM mailing list um, and we can make uh, the, this talk available through that also. Thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I just want to signpost before we go that Stephen, Vivian and Sonia will be leading on our next online event, which will take place on the 24th of September. I think Ryan will pop a link to that in the chat soon. You can book to attend. And at that event, um, there will be the opportunity to uh, discuss the call for submissions for the International Journal of Community Music Special Edition. Uh, we also have uh, several other upcoming events, so please do have a look on our website for those. Um, you can continue to uh, receive the notifications from our mailing list. Um, but for now, I think we're almost at a close, unless there was anybody else from the wider ICCM team, or Stephen, if you wanted to add anything else. Um, before we do. Okay, I think we're going to finish this call early. As you can tell, it's been a challenge, but we are very grateful to see all of you here. Thank you very much. And we hope that you will join us again soon. Thank you all. Um, I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>